All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the fifth day of August in the year of our Lord, 2024. Man, how time flies. The older you get, the faster it goes. Well, it's, I guess that's better than sitting in, like, second grade, staring out the window and looking at the clock as it slowly moved backwards. It's like, tick, tick, uh. Um... Yeah. <clears throat> yes, time moves really slow when you're young. Often. Especially in school. At least in my case. I didn't want to be there. I was much more of an outdoors person. I would rather be. Uh, anyway. Uh, today, at as of this particular moment, at least, as far as I can tell... First of all, the, the news, oh, they hype everything. Uh, one of the things I saw this morning, I usually do this before I look at the Internet, but, was global financial collapse. <laughs> it was only on a few channels, though, so I was like, really? Um, the Nikkei, the uh, Japanese market was down like 10%, which is considerable. Out of fears over the American economy. Well, if your hope is based on the American economy, uh, he that trusts in money is a fool, put it that way. And as you get older, you realize you can't depend on that stuff. I've, I've seen it. Around the world, we've seen it. Mexico, I mean, they experienced it. Uh, your, your money can go down by 90%. Overnight, when nobody nobody's telling you what's going to happen, and then bang, talk about conspiracy, yeah, conspiracy to defraud the the Mexican people of of their savings in an instant, which didn't didn't happen. It happened. Uh, let's see, we moved down there. What about two thousand one? And uh, down to the uh, Mexican border in Texas and uh, I think it was about 10 years before that so it'd be about 1990-ish that the Mexicans devalued their their peso it was pretty much I think uh, pegged to the dollar and then they devalued <laughs> then it became by the time we were down there it was like 10 cents 10 pesos to the dollar and that 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 is that's outright theft. But you cannot trust. Well, even if it, you can't trust gold and silver. I mean that that value is not. It it doesn't have any intrinsic worth, really. It has some purposes, but I mean the the value of the of the metal is not simply based on its utilitarian use. Uh, uh, in the United States, I mean, the, the foolish people in the United States think their securities in gold. Well, they forgot what uh, what uh, Franklin Roosevelt did during the uh, Depression when he came into office, because he had the young monetarists and basically wanted a fiat currency. So they confiscated the gold supply. They confiscated, they, they outlawed individual ownership of gold. So you had to turn your gold in, which they promptly paid you uh, the set price of, I think it was $20 an ounce or something for it. And then Roosevelt uh, raised the price of gold once he had it all in order to print more money. And then Nixon came along and, we don't need that stinking silver and gold anymore. See, before he was in office, you could go down to your local bank and take your 
uh, take your say, take, pull out a five dollar bill, which was actually amounted to something back then, and say, "I would like five silver dollars." You can get it, even though that gold wasn't legal to purchase and own as an individual. Silver was okay. Uh, so you, it was still the the currency was still based on something. It was still on the gold standard, and uh, you could redeem it for silver. Uh, that didn't last much longer than that. Uh, so then, then uh, uh, Nixon just took it off, and we went to the petrodollar. <laughs> Made the deal with Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Saudi hasn't has uh, said that deal's expired now. Yeah, they're not uh, tied to the dollar anymore. They sell oil. In other currencies, which means the United States can no longer print unlimited supplies of money <clears throat> uh, based on the global demand for the dollar. See, if countries don't need to use dollars to buy oil, the demand for the dollar goes down. That means you, the dollar becomes subject to the usual monetary restrictions that if you print more money it inf you fl inflate the currency it goes down in value see genuine inflation is what the government does it is not r rising prices prices can rise because of shortages in demand or fall because of those factors that is not inflation do not believe the nonsense they tell you on media because these experts don't even understand what they're talking about. This is basic economics. Inflation is comes from manipulating the supply of currency. It's called monetary easing. That is the Orwellian language for inflating your currency in the United States. <laughs> Boy, do we do it. Yeah, they allow the Fed to do it, the quasi-independent bank-owned federal government control printing press. Uh, yeah, which goes back to what? The early part of the 20th century? Nevertheless, uh, the, the more important news is uh, so far Iran has not uh, struck back at Israel. I suspect they're not stupid. I, 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 the, I, Israel's been trying to, obviously trying to bait Hezbollah and Iran in order to widen the war. So if your enemy wants a war, are you going to give it to him? I think Iran might be uh, smarter than that, and... Um, uh, they're, they've demonstrated in the last few years that they're actually one of the adults in the room. Um, and the Americans don't want to accept that because of uh, the Iranian hostage crisis. But Americans are ignorant of the history of America's dealings with Iran, including the uh, CIA overthrow of uh, the president, elected President Mossadegh. Back in, I think it was 53 or something like that, 1953. <clears throat> yeah, and, and the American installing, uh, installed the Shah, who the Iranian people hated. The Shah and his secret police, which were trained by the United States. He was a brutal ruler. But he was ours. So you're not allowed to know about it. You won't hear it on Fox or CNN. They're the same thing. Um, so, anyway, Israel, according to the International Court of Justice, has no right to, to occupy any of uh, Palestine. So, uh, that would put them back to the 1949 borders? That would be an appropriate reduction. See, the problem with Israel, too, is the Palestinian people were never asked for their consent. 
See, the, the United Nations is an instrument of world powers. It is not uh, uh, the United Nations. And in the aftermath of World War II, of course, the the, uh, uh, the Holocaust. But let's remember the ho that uh, almost, uh, t although the, that, that half of the people that died in the camps were indeed Jews, uh, half of them weren't. So the Nazis were going after all kinds of people, Slavs, especially Russians. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, and, and then some of their allies were actually farther down on their list. You know, like the Poles cooperated with the Nazis in many ways uh, at times, or certain factions among them. But yet they were on the Nazi list for eradication too. Uh, in the the Nazi plan to expand the uh, uh, the land of Germany. Uh, they wanted living space, uh, Lebensraum, living space. And I wanted to push out other people. Now, they're not the only one that's done that. The American Indians did that. <laughs> and, the, and the colonists did the same thing to the American Indians. Pushed them out. The stronger pushing out the weaker. Yeah, the the Sioux, you know that uh, the Sioux Indians, the the Plains Indians, the horse culture uh, that a lot existed from eternity, for, according to the Indians and in their traditions, uh, they were relatively recent inhabitants of uh, the Plains. They were pushed out by stronger tribes in the uh, north central part of the United States, driven out of the woods, driven west into that area, and uh, without the horse. It was not a very uh, hospitable area to live in either. Uh, the, the Great Plains out there were almost imp not easy to travel in, and uh, the buffalo were difficult for people to hunt on foot and very dangerous. Of course, to get within bow or lance range of a buffalo was a bit dangerous too, but if you were on a pony, it was easier. So the, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the things that are taken for granted and taught is, in that case, taught to their, uh, tr by tradition, that we've always, since, uh, since the formation of the world, since the, the great father created it all, we've always been here. <laughs> no, they weren't. They were, I think the horse culture was, um, really didn't come to pass probably until the 1700s sometimes. And then it was... It's surprising how sh short duration some things really are, like the existence of the United States. But uh, back to, uh, uh, I don't know why I'm talking about this stuff. Well, to, what we're taught in public school or in private school, which is basically the same thing. My experience with Christian private schools is, I wasn't personally involved in a student there, but is, uh, well, they're really the same thing with just a little prayer at it. Um, it it's, it's just a, a, a different coat of paint on it, but underneath the structure and everything else is the same. It goes back to the, the 19th century and the progressives, the atheist progressives that, that really were, are considered uh, as the founders of, American public education. They were not nice people. They were anti-Christian. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, Christians are just ignorant. <laughs> they think, they think, well, but we know what, where they, who they really belong to and serve. So, okay, what I want to do is really talk about it. But uh, the the news, I it hasn't at least Ar Iran hasn't. Uh, them with uh, what people expect them to do. Um, Israel is talking about a preemptive strike, and that would be exactly what Iran wants. Go ahead, strike us. Then they'll just uh, the whole world's already against you, and then you'll just prove what you really are. Again, uh, speaking of Israel, and well, the most shameless thing I've seen, I think, in my lifetime in the United States, personally is uh, the Congress is worshiping 
uh, Netanyahu, the genocidal war criminal, and that's the only terms that can be used for him. And there's certainly a lot more uh, authoritative and knowledgeable people than me that use those terms, like uh, Professor uh, Mersheimer from the University of Chicago that you can find on the internet uh, being consulted as an expert by uh, reasonable people. And uh, yeah, there, there's no question about it. He's in, you, you, all you have to do is look at the a genocide convention and Israel's guilty, totally guilty. Uh, good, uh, and they've been actually guilty of it for since 1948, but they've established a very good PR department that they've been pushing since 1948. Uh, and now they've sort of taken over in many ways, and that was demonstrated in Congress. That although I think roughly half the Democrats and one Republican did not attend a Netanyahu's speech. Um, many of those met privately with him later. Uh, the Republican was Massey, who is a uh, libertarian isolationist. Good plan. That's what Washington, George Washington, suggested. Do not involve yourself in foreign entanglements. Uh, good advice. But, uh, uh, yeah, so Israel is, the, the news is they are con considering a preemptive strike because they're convinced that Iran is going to do something. Uh, Iran has a lot of options, and a missile barrage is probably not in Iranian interest. Because they don't want a bro they don't want a war with Israel. They're trying to develop their own country. They've got all kinds of new friends and new options now. Uh, the uh, 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 the American attempt to destroy Russia, which has been a long term project, going back to uh, at least uh, well, the, it really began in earnest during the Maidan coup, where the uh, some of the current actors were actually over there encouraging that in, in 2014. Uh, it was uh, a plot to, to take over, uh, get control of uh, Ukraine and install a hostile government, hostile to Russia, there. And what they did is they installed the neo-Nazi regime of the, the supporters of, of uh, the World War II, uh, the infamous World War II character known, known as Stefan Bandera, and uh, who was a collaborationist with the Nazis and had the same ideology. But somehow in the Ukrainian version of that racial supremacist ideology, Ukrainians are the only true people, and everybody else is subhuman. You know, that's not that uncommon. Uh, in the Talmud, you find the same idea. Uh, quite explicitly, there are sections in the Tal Talmud that you can look up online or others, other ways uh, that have to do with the relationship between the Jewish people and Gentiles, non-Jews. And you'll find a, although Judaism isn't strictly racial, it is predominantly racial, uh, an idea, and this is dating, the, the Talmud was first began to be written around 300 A.D., uh, off the top of my head, it's, or 200-something, I believe, uh, to codify the, uh, the teaching, the, the unwritten uh, teachings, the traditions of the Pharisees. That's what rabbinic Judaism is. It's a tradition of the Pharisees, developed uh, beyond the New Testament time, and uh, when Israel was exiled from the land for good cause, <laughs> I might add, by God. So you have those that rejected Christ, and the, uh, the Sadducees were, uh, they didn't survive the fall of the temple because they were the, the party of the temple. And uh, the, the Pharisees were uh, the party of the synagogues that developed apparently 
perhaps during the Babylonian captivity. But uh, so they they essentially controlled the synagogues and Jewish education, and, and they were hostile toward uh, to Christ. They their their tradition superseded the scriptures, as Jesus makes very plain in the New Testament, and they haven't got any better at that. But in the Talmud, uh, the, the section that deals with Jewish relations with uh, uh, non-Jews, uh, if you read that, and I'm not necessarily suggesting you read it because it's going to have a profound uh, effect on your feelings <laughs> toward the Jewish people if you're not a Jew, perhaps, uh, but it could explain some of the pogroms and other things that were uh, launched here and there against Jewish communities. Why did the Gentiles drive them out of their community? Perhaps because of what the Talmud taught. There's some very good reason in the Talmud, that you wouldn't necessarily want Jews that practice what the Talmud teaches uh, as your neighbors, if you're not a Jew. There would not be people you'd be particularly apt to trust, according to those that would be consistent with what the teaching of the Talmud. Now, the Talmud is... Uh, the collection of the writings and opinions of rabbis over the centuries. So it's, uh, but, uh, I mean, this is a, a, you know, it's sort of divided up into subjects. It's a whole series of volumes. And this is not the major teaching of it, but do, does have a whole section devoted to how Jews should relate to non-Jews. And it's not authoritative uh, Truly, but it is the foundation of rabbinic Judaism. And it has authority, but it's, I mean, if, if you don't agree with it, you know, it's, 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 there's a whole lot of opinions in there. And it's, uh, it's not like a prophet sent from God. So it's, it's not like scripture. But it, it replaced the scripture. And because the Jews couldn't keep the Old Testament covenant anyway exiled out of out of the land there there was no possibility of fulfilling the commandments and sacrifices and everything else and so that that is today too and and, and when you see some of the outrageous stories like the uh, attempts to the, the protests against the possible punishment of Israeli soldiers for committing acts of, of YouTube's very touchy about some of this stuff. Acts that were committed by the people of the plain in the area that where Israel now is. Uh, certain cities that were uh, where Lot in, uh, dwelt. Uh, in the time of Abraham, Christians should know what I'm talking about. But... Uh, uh, <sighs> There, there were there were protests outside, trying to actually trying to break in to, in Israel by Israeli citizens, trying to break in. They were forced the gates of Israeli military installations because apparently uh, they were protesting the possibility that the soldiers that abused prisoners, male and female, physically abused them. physically penetrated them. There were protests that, against the possible punishment of these people. That, that It's their right. And, you know, you see that, well, what are they doing? Well, that it would not be inconsistent with the Talmud. Uh, the Talmud doesn't directly justify that. But there is a, uh, the Jews are above everybody else, and everybody else is sort of in the class of animals. You can get that idea from the Talmud. Um, and there, th that it's better for the rest of us just sim simply to die. That would be what some of the rabbis taught. 
that are in the Talmud. So you can look it up. I mean, there, there's doesn't mean all the rabbis teach that, and certainly not all Jews believe that today. The ultra-Orthodox tend to, uh, to oppose that kind of stuff. Uh, and they often oppose Israel itself. They don't believe that Israel is, is legitimate. But from personal experience in Israel, what I was told when a guy got a little... An, ortho, an ultra-Orthodox Jew got a little irritated with me because I was challenging his presentation to a bunch of Gentiles that were over there. Um, I was saying, well, but the Bible says this. And uh, he, at one point he got irritated and said, when the Messiah comes, we're going to put everyone like you to the sword. And I was taken back by that. Christians don't have that attitude. So, uh, the, the Christians we have are in the United States. We have a uh, uh, tend to have a very strong prejudice against Iran, even though the United States created the problem over there, and Iran was our strongest ally in the Middle East um, for many years. Not Israel, Iran. And that was one reason why the American establishment was so upset. They lost their power base. I mean, we furnished the Shah with our most advanced weapons, other than nuclear. We furnished him with F-14 Tomcats and a lot of stuff top of the line he got the best because he was our guy and he kept his people subservient he was the American puppet dictator and he used his Savic secret police trained by America to suppress any dissent and that led to the Iranian revolution and the rise of, of uh, Islam as a religion, as the government, as a reaction. Khomeini uh, led the revolution by publishing audio cassettes, which you can duplicate in bulk. In bulk. And that was his weapon, the audio cassette. Now that I've I've spilled out some history here, so th that's that's uh, the background to what's going on over there, right now. Uh, uh, Israel and Iran were allies. Uh, Iran, uh, in fact, Israel refurbished a lot of uh, aircraft for Iran, even after the revolution. I think for a while, you know, because at one time, Iraq, Saddam Hussein was the threat. And Iran was, you know, sort of Israel was using Iran as a, to, a way to get at uh, Iraq, the the nearer enemy versus the farther one. So it, it's it's a tangled web. But but the display uh, back to Israel, the display that I saw with uh, in the Congress over is uh, Netanyahu's speech welcoming this. Expl man that is condemned around the world is a war criminal D condemned by the International Court of, Court of Justice I mean, it's, it's in your face genocide what he's doing in Gaza and the Congress welcoming him to, and, and applauding him as they did it was an act of worship prostrating themselves before Netanyahu. The biblical word worship is pro in the Greek is proskunio, and it means to, to prostrate yourself or to kiss toward. That's what they were doing. Shameless, especially the Republicans. At least some of the Democrats uh, didn't show up. Good for them on that particular thing. 
with the Republicans, except for Massey, the one a Republican with integrity. Shut up. I mean, some of the people that showed up might not have been in favor of him, but I don't know. He was shameless. Hopefully Rand Paul wouldn't have been. Maybe he, I, I don't know if he was president or not, but uh, th th see, this is ridiculous. And, and there's, there is no choice between the candidates. Harris and Trump both serve the same master. Netanyahu. She met privately later. Uh, because obviously she didn't want to offend part of her base because uh, Netanyahu and what Israel is doing in Gaza is not popular with young voters. They're not thrilled about genocide. They're not thrilled about America being uh, America being a partner, a full partner in genocide. That's one of the reasons why they really had to dump Biden. He's an old fossil. And the forces behind, and some have referred to the um, Biden being removed from the ticket as a coup. And when you have a person in Biden's condition, <laughs> it could be called that. Maybe constructive coup, I don't know. Uh, at, at one point I had to say, well, even Harris would be better than Biden. At least she's not of come she may not be of sound moral character but she might still have some brain cells functioning uh, okay so th this is not really what i wanted to talk about but this is, so what i wanted to talk about again i the video i just posted a few days ago was uh was about genuine christianity versus what you could call institutional Christianity, state Christianity, uh, or variations of it. It goes back to the time of Constantine. The Christian church was becoming more worldly even before that. It, the, the difference is between true, true New Testament Christianity requires a personal relationship with God in Jesus Christ. It requires real living faith in Christ. It requires that you're born again by the power of God. It's an act of God that makes you a Christian. And when and, and the transition was already underway to an institutional, sacramental system, that more like pagan religion or Old Testament religion, uh, even prior to Constantine. But Constantine... Uh, crystallized the transition. He began the institutionalization uh, of uh, the church in, in the fact as a partner with the state or as a mistress of the state, really, uh, for political purposes. Uh, obviously, look at Donald Trump. He wants to use Christians. He gets upset if Christians don't worship him, uh, don't fawn at him. You know, he... He so, complains when Christians hesitate to vote for him. He was just saying the other day that, uh, vote for me, you won't have to vote in four years. I mean, what, I don't know what he was talking about, but I, I, the best thing I could say about it is, okay, I'm going to fix America. You know, Donald Trump's ego, make America great again. And you won't have, so it won't, in, in four years, if you decide you really don't want to get your hands dirty in politics, it won't matter because America is going to be fine by then. <laughs> to put the best spin on it, as opposed to what the liberals have put on it. But, but yeah, but Trump is fully in support of genocide in Gaza, too. And Harris is. So there's really, I look at that and say, that, that, that's a deal-breaking issue. You know, genocide, that sort of trumps everything else. Doesn't it? Wouldn't you say? If you're going to act like the, uh, the enemy in World War II, that every, the enemy of the world, uh, well, actually the Japanese did the same things too. So it's, genocide is not a uniquely German thing at all. But uh, you can go back to history and find plenty of examples of it. But as far as 
anybody that has any claim to being a Christian to supporting that. And one of the things that that has kept me away from church at all is the only churches that are reasonably biblical would be like the um, conservative evangelical slash fundamentalists, and they tend to be dispensationalists, which are makes them often rabidly pro-Israel. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand what they're doing, but they were in they were indoctrinated with teachings of a man named John Darby, and then C.I. Schofield. There's just a historic accidents in this uh, that has to do with you know a lot of history there. But uh, and they're ignorant. Christians tend to be biblically ignorant that they believe the preacher and the preachers go off to their Bible colleges or to their universities and seminaries and are filled with this stuff. Uh, fundamentalist templates don't have seminaries generally. But uh, so that, that is baked into this them and a popular evangelical and fundamentalist literature is baked into more evangelical. I don't know if there's a... Uh, m real sharp line in between them anymore, but uh, you'll find almost all evangelicalism and fundamentalism in the United States are, uh, has uh, a dispensationalist interpretation of the scripture, which again goes back to Darby and Schofield and others, and it is faulty. It's faulty. Especially when, when it refers to um, now, when this came about, Israel, the, the state of Israel did not exist. But with the coming of the state of Israel, it sort of added impetus to this system of doctrine, end times prophetic system of doctrine, and how the state of Israel has to be reestablished. And the Bible doesn't say that. It, doesn't. it didn't exist at a state at the time. It was a province under the direct rule of Rome in the time of Christ under Pontius Pilate. It was not by any sense a nation, a, a political entity anymore. It had local, certain amount of local rule, but unlike uh, much of the Roman Empire, it was not, uh, you know, like uh, in Galilee you had Herod, King Herod over Galilee. But uh, the, Judea was too problematic, so the Romans had to install their own governor. Uh, they were a problem. <laughs> they were. Uh, but that's why dispensationalism is, and it's, it, it's not promoted by name, usually. It's taught through popular evangelical Christendom. Uh, still, uh, you look at uh, CBN, uh, Pat Robertson's creation, Christian Broadcasting Network. They are rabidly pro-Israel. They, they pretend to be politically astute and they have their news programs and everything else, but their news programs are more biased than Fox, which is rabidly pro-Israel. I mean, it's just part of their, the baked-in understanding of the Bible, and it has to do with the return of Jesus Christ. They believe that, that Israel must rebuild the temple in Jerusalem uh, and that's exactly what the current administration or regime in, in Israel wants to do. These these radicals, they, they want to, uh, and that led to October 7th, by the way. It was Israeli uh, invasions, repeated invasions of the, of the, uh, uh, the Temple Mount, the, the Muslim holy site that exists there today, and their declaration that they were going to take it over and build a temple there, literally. Now. And that provoked protests and everything else, and it provoked uh, October 7th. They called it El Aksa Flood. It, it, the reaction against the, the Jewish invasions of the Muslim holy site which I believe is the third holiest location for Muslims in the world, after Mecca and Medina, which are both in Saudi Arabia today. So, I mean, but Christians are ignorant of this stuff. I mean, 
evangelical Christians. They just believe they're pastors and they read the, the garbage paperback books. Late Great Planet Earth was uh, influential in my thoughts. I mean, I was indoctrinated into dispensationalism not knowing I was being indoctrinated into it because it was just part of the subculture and popular literature. It was about the return of Christ. Well, but it's based on faulty interpretations. You don't have to. The, the, it's not what the it's not what the Bible actually says, but man's interpretation of it, and man's interpretation being taken as gospel. Dangerous. So uh, I can't go too long. I've got to let the chickens out. <laughs> literally, it's getting light out, light out there. So uh, six fifteen in the morning, sun is beginning to come up. So anyway, uh, back to the subject. Back to the subject. The, uh, the 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 it's the absolute has to. We have to understand the di difference between. I shouldn't really. It's not a really good term, but I have to use it. Relational Christianity versus institutional Christianity or state Christianity. See, Christianity in the United States. Mainstream Christianity, evangelical Christianity, Protestant Christianity, especially Protestant, let's say mainstream Protestant, Catholic, even Orthodox, uh, comes, uh, dis, uh, descends from Constantine. The union of church and state. The vast majority of the Protestant Reformation were uh, simply separated themselves from the Pope and, restore, and moved the church back under the control of the state. They returned to Constantinianism. Augustinianism for the theology and Constantinianism for the uh, uh, relationship. And Constantinian Christianity, by its very nature, cannot be authentic Christianity because it has to be stripped of, of God. It has to be stripped of the supernatural requirement for the new birth. That's strictly a a unmediated work of God. Christ Himself is the only mediator between the Christian and the Father. Christ, the God Man. Personally. There's only one mediator. And Constantine, in order to make a Christianity that was suitable for the Roman Empire, it had to be like Old Testament Christianity. It had to be like paganism. It had to be something that was external and tangible and not real. Something man could do. So it has to have a priesthood that does sacrifices, a priesthood that has special powers that, that, can, that, that mediate the power of God to you through the institution of the church. And that's true of Roman Catholicism, that's true of Orthodoxy, that's true of Protestantism. It's not always true of Evangelicalism. Baptists normally, except for the Reformed Baptists, Baptists normally reject that. They always had a personal view of salvation as a personal relationship. At least the better ones, the more biblical ones. Uh, and others have too. Uh, the great, the, the first Great Awakening. You had uh, Wesley and Whitfield out there preaching one thing that was not really based in their theology, but it was it came out of Scripture. The message they were preaching was, "You must be born again," calling for a new birth. Uh, prior to that, in Lutheranism, there was revival that is now commonly derided as Pietism. But back in the, I believe it was the 1600s, uh, Lutheranism uh, had descended into dead, sterile uh, uh, theology. Uh, and it was all about how, uh, how accurately you described things theologically, theological precisionism. And it was removed from the people. And uh, first it was a man named John Arndt, I believe, 
and then another man named uh, uh, Jacob Spenner who came along and were advocating for uh, saying say it is necessary for the people to have a real, personal, a living relationship with Christ that the church wasn't the source of that life. It had to be Christ himself. So they were advocating for personal Bible study, uh, prayer times, uh, gathering together for prayer meetings or for uh, discipleship or whatever outside the the authority of the church or at least uh, independent or uh, as uh, something that was not necessarily in opposition to the institutional church but was... Uh, supplemented because they recognized that dead, sterile theology couldn't actually produce Christians. And now that's called pietism and is openly derided by conservative Lutherans in the United States, like the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, and then you've got the Wisconsin Synod. They're even more that way, so they, they they become very sectarian and focus on the uh, Book of Concord, the the documents that came out of the uh, Lutheran Reformation, and do you conform to these ideas and the sacraments, because sacraments are what uh, what the institutional church does, and the institutional church is necessary for the sacraments. You have to have the priesthood. Uh, you have to have uh, and uh, the sacramental system to mediate God's grace rather than people connected directly to God. You have to have the middleman of the church, which is exactly what Roman Catholicism is and orthodoxy. And it goes back to Constantine. Because otherwise, so you have to have a religion that's suitable for unregenerate, unborn-again people. But that religion can't save you, even though it's called Christianity. So if you look at, at people, like, it's, like on the Internet, the YouTube, uh, you, you can listen to these people talk, and they, they sound Christian. They sound, uh, uh, would agree with, with Christians on many things. But they locate the, the, uh, their, their faith in the church rather than in Christ himself. Christ is always off there someplace. they got to go to the church to receive Christ's grace. The church is the mediator. Whether it's Protestant, Roman Catholic, or Orthodox Catholic, which is the correct term for the what we call often call Eastern Orthodoxy. Roman are uh, and those are state churches. You have the Russian Orthodox, you have the Ukrainian Orthodox churches. You have uh, the Greek Orthodox. These are state churches because the government, uh, the, the Anglican Church, still a state church. I think uh, Norway is finally deinstitutionalized, but you had uh, uh, the, the state church is deestablished, but I still think there is a, a, some form of state church in Norway. This is what Protestantism is too. It was never returned to biblical Christianity that somewhat reform in doctrine and the doctrine of salvation that's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, generally, Protestants believe that, but, not liberals, but conservatives, but where that relationship exists for Protestants, for mainstream traditional Protestants, it's still that relationship that you, you have with the church because you get the God's grace through the institution of the church and the priesthood of the church, even if we don't call them priests, even if we call them pastors or ministers. You, you go to communion to get God's grace. Uh, you're baptized to become in the in uh, a Christian. That's not biblical Christianity. Baptism and the Lord's Supper is part of biblical Christianity, but it is not the means of grace, and it doesn't require a special priesthood at all. That's the difference. See. To be a real Christian, you have to be born again. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Jesus taught. And you can't make that happen. 
It's something God must do. Something God must choose to do. God has to call you or you don't come. Because you don't want to. God has to draw you to himself. He has to convict you of your sins. And when you see what you, you really are and respond by crying out to him to save you from yourself, because you're the problem, then he answers and changes your heart and your spirit. And unless that's been done in you, unless, as Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, if the Spirit of Christ does not dwell in you, you don't belong to him. It's not a doctrine. It's a, well, it is a doctrine, but it's, it's a living reality. It's not only a doctrine. It has to be a living reality. And that's what happened in the Jesus Revolution. God was saving all kinds of strange kids. Some of them with long hair, some with short hair. Some of them were drug addicts and everything else, and then there's others like me. Became what got into that too. But he would he was pulled us out of the gutter. What we were all looking for something real. See, we, we had been raised in prosperity in the not just in the United States, in Europe too, this thing happened. And we were dissatisfied with it because there's, uh, we realized this is materialism is, is there's nothing there. It's just dust. Capitalist materialism is no better than socialist material. In some ways, it's worse because it says that you live for material possessions. There's nothing there. Even living for things like family, there's nothing eternal there. There is no truth in that. Where, what does all this mean? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What does everything mean? It can't answer that. There's nothing in America that can answer that question, or in Europe, or in Russia. Only in Christ can you find your true purpose, why you exist, what you're supposed to be, and how you can become what you're supposed to be. And that's only in Christ. He himself must do it. God must save you. And the one thing that was universal from my experience, I, mean, I can only talk about you know, as a witness, is everybody that was part of this Jesus revolution, or they're called by some Jesus freaks, were in love with Christ. It was all about Christ what he had done for us. And we belonged to him. That was it. Since those days, many went, we've, we've gone on and got married, and some went to the church. Some of us tried to go to the churches. Some of us even got into pastoring. But it's like, this isn't real Christianity. That was the obstacle for me with being a preacher. You're talking to the congregation. You're talking about real Christianity. You're talking about the new covenant. And you're talking about being born again and how God changes your heart. And people just look at you like, what are you talking about? We're Christians. We got baptized or we went forward. We did something. What are you talking about? You make us feel, this is a quote, you make us feel like we're not Christians or not believers. So I, I was told that, you know, like, not my fault. <laughs> See, you, you don't know what you've never experienced. I mean, we're talking about something that has to be experienced to, to know it. I mean, uh, it's, it's like God. You cannot know God unless you're in a real relationship with him. You can know about God. You can know about the new birth. I can teach you about what the promises of the new birth are. I can teach you what the Bible says about it, but to know what it is, to, 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 you have to really experience it. As Jesus said, you cannot perceive or see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit, or you can't be in the kingdom of God. 
It's that relationship between the individual and God himself in Christ. That's it. And without that, you're, you can call yourself a Christian. You can be a Christian under some definitions of it. You can have a set of beliefs or belong to an institution. But you're not truly in the kingdom of God. You're not truly a child of God until you've been born again. That's what the New Testament teaches. And we don't fit. Those who have been born again, we do not fit in this world. We may try to fit, but we find we are a square peg in a round hole. So I look at what's going on in Washington. I, that has nothing to do with me. And we're constantly bombarded by this world telling us we must be this and must be that. No, I don't fit. I don't fit. You may fool me for a day or two, but I don't fit. I'm stuck living in this world right now, but I don't like it. I do not love this world. If this instant I was taken out of here, I wouldn't miss it. America has nothing for me. See, once you've experienced God, everything else is dirt. Everything else is dust. I mean, your, your, your flesh may want stuff. You might be attracted to things, but, but you, you, it, just, it, just, it will not satisfy a born-again Christian. And if it satisfies you, all I can say is you need to get saved. It's, it's that different. It changes you, not ex in your exterior, but in your, your innermost being. And then gradually that should work out and change, produce changes in your behavior and your attitude. And your, as Paul says, uh, renewal of your mind. See, it's not a different mind, a different thinking, a different history is not automatic. You're still in this mortal body in which sin still dwells. You will still sin. But you're not under its dominion. You're not a slave of it as you were. Your values have changed. Your desires have changed. You hate sin, especially when you do it. And you love God. And you love his people. You may not love church, but you love his people. You want to gather together with them. The problem is when you gather together, it's supposed to be in his name for his purposes. Not to please our flesh and not to, uh, to focus on stuff that's not Christ. If you want to give lectures on... Uh, financial investing or Old Testament history, I really don't care. I'm not going to waste my time. You want to have a religious club? Fine. Have your religious club. But I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in Christ. I want to hear about my Lord and Savior and what he did. See, Christ crucified and Christ risen from the dead never gets old to the person that's born again. Because that's where your life is. That is Christianity. Genuine biblical Christianity. As revealed by Jesus and the prophets. And his apostles. Anything else isn't. There's this huge thing that's called Christendom. Uh, that's man-made Christianity. Watered-down Christianity. Suitable for unsaved people. It may have Christian values. It may have some value to the state. It may promote uh, some good things. But it is not genuine Christianity. Because that requires a personal relationship with God. 